And it was the arch that was the basis of a revolutionary new architecture. The post and lintel system of the ancient world was limited in the space it could span and the weight it could bear. The Romans soon recognized the strength and versatility of the arch and elaborated it into an art form of grandeur and utility. Roman stone arches, like the ones supporting this bridge built across the Tiber in 62 BC, were constructed of wedge-shaped blocks. The blocks, wider at the top than at the bottom, are locked into place by a central keystone. The weight of the structure above compresses the stone blocks and is transmitted evenly from one to another on either side down into the ground. From the arch came a new conception of interior architecture. Extending the arch form through space in a straight line creates a tunnel or barrel vault. Curving the arch form through space, Roman engineers created an annular or ring vault. Two identical barrel vaults crossing at right angles form a groin vault. These dramatic intersections would find lasting expression in the great Romanesque churches of the Middle Ages. By rotating the arch around a fixed center point, they could describe a dome or an apse with a half-domed ceiling. But the arch was only part of the story. It was an extraordinary new building material which made these fluid designs possible. 20 miles from Rome, in the hill town of Palestrina, stand the remains of one of the first great Roman building projects, the Sanctuary of Fortuna, the Goddess of Fortune. Much of it was hidden until a World War II bombing raid sheared away the later housing, revealing this gigantic conception. A series of seven immense terraces rising 400 feet up from the grotto below where the fortune-telling lots were cast for pilgrims, all the way up to a colonnaded rotunda on top where the 17th century palace of the Barberini now stands. And the whole complex was aligned to look out over a breathtaking vista of plain and mountain and with axial symmetry the sea framed by the foothills of the Apennines. Here, Roman architects began to play with the new curvilinear forms, such as this graceful hemicycle with its colonnade, supporting an annular barrel vault inset with coffers that were once richly decorated. This amazing architecture was made possible by something which to us in the 20th century seems so commonplace it would hardly deserve comment. Concrete. Concrete had been used before this time. Uh, a simple mixture of three parts sand, one part lime, broken stone and water. But among its problems for builders was that it dried very swiftly. So it could only really be used for layering courses, never for building entire structures. But in the first century BC, the Romans discovered the almost magical properties of a reddish volcanic sand called Pozzolana, which comes from Pozzuoli near Naples. Concrete made with Pozzolana has a very different quality. It's very strong. It can be used in wet conditions. It dries slowly, so entire structures could be built, bonded from top to bottom as one, even including domes. So this simple discovery marks a revolution in Roman and in Western architecture. It made possible all the greatness which would follow. At the height of its imperial power, Rome was a sprawling city crowded with a million citizens and slaves. To keep them occupied, there were public baths, race courses like the Circus Maximus, and the great amphitheater decreed by the Emperor Vespasian in 75 AD.
with its massive facade of superimposed arches, the Colosseum seems to express in stone the grandiose dreams of all empire builders. But it was a most functional building. Its gates numbered for ticket holders, its concentric vaulted corridors designed to funnel 50,000 spectators to their seats with maximum efficiency. Built of stone, brick and concrete, the Colosseum's huge oval interior offered every Roman an unobstructed view of the slaughter in the arena below. Arena being the Latin word for the sand that covered the wooden floor and absorbed the blood. Today, the Colosseum impresses us more as an amazing feat of architecture than as a work of art, though it strongly influenced the design of both Renaissance palaces and modern sports arenas. This three-dimensional scale model depicts Rome in the fourth century, virtually at the end of its spectacular imperial building program. Of all the great constructions throughout the empire, one stands above all others as the crowning achievement of Roman architecture, the Pantheon. Fittingly, it is a work that expresses not the ugliness of our baser instincts, but our sense of wonder about worlds beyond our own. Who built the Pantheon, and when, was long a mystery. The Latin dedication tells us it was built by Marcus Agrippa, Augustus' son-in-law and consul. This, it turned out, refers to the first Pantheon on this site, a much more conventional temple. The answer lay hidden for centuries in the brick facing of the Pantheon's 25-foot-thick concrete rotunda. Archaeologists had found that many Roman bricks were stamped with the name of the consul in office when they were made. Almost all the Pantheon's bricks were made around 120 AD, revealing that its builder was the Emperor Hadrian, a man of passionately artistic sensibility and a particular love for architecture. <laughs> 